Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 26. We're going to make this shorter, and you guys might like that. Give us some feedback in the comments down below. Uh, we're going to dive right into the, uh, to the strategy, but we don't have a lot of time because... We're going to have a baby. Well... Well, I am. I guess, like, as a couple, we're having a baby, but... Yeah, I mean, it, technically, I push it. So, but uh, it, it was 7.30 this morning. We had to be there, and now it's 10. It could move back. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, so then we'd have more time. But we're not banking on that. Right. So we're supposed to be at the hospital at 10 a.m., and we're awaiting the arrival of Lily. Uh, tomorrow is Easter Sunday. Sure is. So and today is Jackson's good. second birthday. Yes, we've already wished him happy birthday, but we need to get this show on the road. Here we go. So let's go. So I want to talk about uh, cheap seed blends, and this is something near and dear to my heart. It always has been. Um, I started experimenting with food plots, 99 Um Mixing brassica and clover, for example, no one else was doing that in the country that was in publication or anything. So did that a lot, perfected the process of getting big bulbs out of the brassica. And and then always the crop rotations. I was in the UP of Michigan, uh, first started planting in 95 in the thumb area and sandy soil. Um, there really wasn't much information out there at that time. No, you were, it sounds like you were doing a lot of experimenting. You were weighing a lot of your own seed, you know. Right. Doing a lot of mixing of different uh, of seed blends of that were really your your own back then too. Right. You know? Yeah, and that's I had a lot of help from Jim Islip at the County Extension. Yeah. Um, Ed Spinazzola back in the day encouraged me to plant different varieties, but Jim's one, the the one that told me you know really how to manipulate moisture and uh, fertility levels, lime. And uh, what would actually be a fit? Um, he's one that said, no, you can plant food plots when others told me you cannot on this really bad soil. So um, it, this goes back a long ways. Uh, food plot book published in 2014. Food plot web class. Uh, hundreds of food plot videos and articles. So this is near and dear to my heart. And now we have a seed company. We've had it for almost two years now, which is crazy. Yeah, it seems weird. And Jen is headed that. Uh, we would not have the seed company if it was not for Jen. It's been fun. It's been a good learning experience. And then, and then also Wes. Yeah. And full time. I and mean, we wouldn't have enough time. No way. Wes. Absolutely not. We we ship so much seed out the door. Um, yeah. That, and so thank you so much. And, and one of the reasons why, you know, this isn't about why our seed is better. It's about what to avoid in the, in the food plot seed industry. There's so many different brands popping up. Yes. One thing is experience, and I, and I want to, we'll talk about experience in a couple different ways, but a lot of experience has to go in the blends. I specifically put that experience into another food plot company for, uh, for 10 to 11 years, help them build that. Um, but that was based on that experience, those blends, um, all those levels of research, uh, all the writings I had in Michigan Out of Doors, quality whitetails for the QDMA, my own book, uh, hundreds of articles written. A lot of experience went into that, and that's what you need to demand from somebody that's playing food plots. Not that they have pretty plots, though. Pretty plots are one thing. You want their, the food plots to have volume, but if it doesn't translate into success... You're not going to have anything. Well, and two, cheap is not always better. You know, cheapest is definitely not always better. <laughs> yeah, no. You know, and that goes along with experience too, where if there's seed companies out there that don't have experience, they may sell their blends for less, you know, and make a significant less money to try to just sell their seed. And likely it has that inert matter in it, or it has that extra filler in yeah, it. Yeah, because that's where profit margins come in. Exactly. And that's, Jen's the profit margin queen. She's the one that <laughs> we look at the business. She ran uh, the numbers for uh, local power sports dealerships. She was a GM for seven years. So literally the GM made money on her decisions or not. And that could come down to a few percentage points in one area. And I'm sure thinking could. like finance, um, yeah. conversion of uh, extra, what would you call them? A conversion of sales where you, someone's financing and what's that yeah, called when they add gap insurance and. Oh, it's the, just the, yeah, you can call it a conversion sale. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. So if someone wasn't converting as your finance manager, those it sales. Was, yeah, it wasn't good. Yeah. You so know, and it, yeah. A few We'd percentage points could. Make a uh, huge difference. And so that's why we want to have a viable business that runs lean, makes money. And, and for example, there are businesses out there that it could matter a food plot uh, business or anything, a car dealership, a sport, yeah. power sports, where if you run into a bad year, um, you could be done. 
and we don't want that. We want to run lean enough so that we're in it for the long whole haul, no different than we are with our partners. Okay. Um, we, we've Matthew's bows I've shot since 92. Family tradition tree stands has been a decade or more. Uh, lacrosse boots. Lacrosse boots, I think I had my first pair in the late 80s. So it's going back a long ways with a lot mm-hmm. of our products we use, and I could, the list goes on and on. Uh, redneck blinds, that's the only blind I've ever had. Well, and, you know, and we can... <coughs> Other than a pop-up. Tap. Uh, sure. Yeah. And we could look at all of those partners as, you know, similar to Seed, where they all have that vast knowledge of experience. Look at lacrosse footwear. Right. You know, look at uh, Reveal. Oh. Um, you look at Redneck. I don't want to keep going because I know I'm going to miss people. Matthew's bow. I mean, yeah. look at the innovation over the years, you know, that... Uh, and that's why we partnered with Reveal. Even just being able to see the cameras in action through you for two years. Sure. Before we even made the switch. Right. And it's, I, I and only want to go with the best, period. Right. And like with Seed, we're always doing stuff to make it better. You're you're always adjusting and looking at all these blends and saying, maybe we should our, adjust this by a... change... Well, I like... 80% every they year. They do, but it's not like, like it's a, a lot. Subtle. Yeah, just like a small little percentage here, taking a little bit of this out, adding a little bit more of this. And all of our partners are innovating and doing those same things. Well, if you're never chasing perfection, you're never improving. Yeah. Period. Yeah, we had You can't uh, just sit there. Even if you have a great product, you're not improving, and that's a bad thing. And so we're always improving. Yeah, we chase your fear. We heard that last night. We heard it from a very successful businessman last night. Mm-hmm. He was giving a little nice inspirational talk to my son, Sam, who's 18. And Sam's been making some good decisions lately. And yeah. uh, and this person piled on to those good decisions. Yeah, it was kind of like it was, pre- it was unsolicited. And, very uh, unsolicited. From an incredibly uh, successful person. And they yeah. just chase your fears. Mm-hmm. Chase your fears was a big yeah. thing. Yeah. He um, basically said be uncomfortable. And so the experience is one thing. Someone could have experience farming, food plotting, and and growing great food. But if it doesn't translate into results, it's all for naught. Mm -hmm. We're trying to build successful deer herds. We're not planting food out there just for the fun of it. Um, I was about to say something else. It is fun, though. It is fun. (laughs) It is fun, but we own the land because we want to have a good deer herd. Right. And we want to have a good hunt. You can't have a good deer herd without a good hunt. You can't have a good hunt without a good deer herd. So if someone says, well, our hunting's not that great, but we have a good deer herd, that's BS. Right. That, that First. <laughs> they don't, the two don't go together. No, they don't. Um, you, have to, you have to have both. And so your food plots have to be optimum for when you need it the most. I'm a low, lowest hole in the bucket kind of guy. And so I look at it like we need to plug this lowest hole of fall food. Mm-hmm. summer food and this was taught to me by john ozoka years ago famed white tail research biologist has the most peer-reviewed articles out of anybody ever in the country but he taught me like in the up of michigan where i was at and most of the midwest in fact all of the midwest probably all the north half of the country northeast third of the country for white tails um, deer have five times more food during the summertime than they actually can consume or need mm-hmm. So one of the tricks is even during summertime, if you have summer food, you don't want to congregate them all into a five-acre area all summer long with 30 deer because it's stressful. Stress creates loss in body weight, uh, lower fawn survival. Herd stress is horrible. They leave your land. They have to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So if you have summer food that they're eating, but you're pulling them out of, say, for example, hundreds of acres of ag or thousands of acres of ag where they can space out, and live a stress-free life during the summertime, you're doing them a disservice no matter how mm-hmm. high the quality of food that you're offering. Right. So there's always a balance, but the lowest hole in the buckle, bucket is you have to have fall food that creates a great deer herd. You don't create a deer herd in the summer. You don't create a deer herd in the spring. Mm-mm. And so we have to have that fall food, and, uh, and that's what we started, our first two blends. Yeah, our uh, brassica and our fall power. Yep, and those are my two staple blends mm-hmm. from... 25 years of research and experimentation and playing around and planting and having fun. Yeah, and they work. You know, you got one side of where it's an early season, you know, your fall power, and then you got your brassicas on the other side. And then and the uh, fall power, you have the rye. We like to layer into it later yeah. so that you have food in the spring, which is the most missed time in the deer woods before spring green up. Mm-hmm. Clover doesn't hit that. Alfalfa doesn't hit it. Only wheat or rye. So that's a big part of what we do. And uh, we actually sell it. But 
where would we encourage people to buy it? Go to your local co-op. We sell it as just the convenience, you know, and we, yeah. um, just for people. So it's a one-stop shop, but, um, we make the least amount of money on our rye or buckwheat. Uh, it's probably, it's, it's the, between those two, it's probably wash to be honest with you. Yeah. We do those um, as a convenience too, because yeah. some people can't find it. It's yeah. Which for is them just to order it. Right. And so of course we encourage you to shop local for, you know, your bulk seeds and stuff like that, but. Right. But well, if we you have go it, into, if the, like it. into the mixed seeds, you want experience again, but you want to say, what have you done with your plantings? Mm -hmm. Because if they're not refining their plantings based on what deer want, and we do at times hundreds of clients a year, literally hundreds of clients a year as a team. Um, I've averaged about 100 clients for the last, I don't know, 15 years. I'm, this is my 20th season designing whitetail properties and designing food plot programs. The two go hand in hand. It's been very rare that I go to a, a private land. I would, I'm saying probably five, uh, less than 10 out of 1,600 parcels uh, didn't have food plots to design and offer mm -hmm. prescription for success. You want to look at what they're recommending, and they better have some results because just because it grows well, just because it looks pretty, just because deer hit it during the summertime, just because deer hit it in March or February or January does not mean that you're doing a good job because if you're not building a quality herd, and when you're building a quality herd during the fall, when did deer need nutrition the most, Miss Jen? They need it. During the rut? During the rut, during the winter, mm. during the fall, during the buildup to the winter. When everything is not green anymore. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Your eyes a little... Yeah, it's a little, I'm a little uncomfortable. But Her heart rate's been going up to about a one, 120. And uh, yeah, just blood pressure's here. been super high. And she'll just sit here, it'll go up. Her lips get tingly. and. Yeah, so sometimes I look right through you. <clears throat> but it's important to have and good I quality. Tell the stare. <laughs> it's important to have good quality food in the f in the fall, um, and and especially too during the winter. You know, we had a, a light winter this year. Uh, oh, and, geez, yeah. You know, and w I mean, f for shed antler hunting, that was good for us. <laughs> you yeah. know, so we were. Yeah, we found some more. Found uh, another one yesterday. Yeah, yeah. You and Sam found another one yesterday. Um, but it's very important to have good quality food, uh, fall, winter, and then in in the spring. Right, and and that's. M if I had to rank it, it'd probably be winter first, but a lot of your fall food carries into winter. If you don't have enough for winter, you wouldn't have had any in the fall. You, your f winter is surplus food. Mm -hmm. So whatever's left over from your fall endeavors carries over into winter. So you attack your fall first. You can't just plant something for the winter unless you fence it all off, open it in January, which then you wouldn't have a deer herd there because they're already shot and killed or they've already established a fall and winter residency somewhere else and they're not going to hit your food. Mm -hmm. So you have to have that balance of offering fall, winter, those are the two most important, spring, third most important before spring green up, and then summer is the least important. So a lot of times if folks are recommending summer food, they have a poor uh, they have a poor track record for actually building herds themselves and hunting. So you want to see this food plot seed used and used successfully somewhere. Um, and that's what we've done. And uh, the food plots are the most critical on the land, but then at the same time, they're the highest risk, which gets into the strategy of food plotting mm -hmm. and not spooking off deer. But if you don't have the food that's trying to peak in November the best you can with that green base, then corn, then summer food if needed. Sure. Um, and I don't think you're saying summer food is, um, it's not always bad. No. You know, if you are if you need to build a deer herd, like if, you, you know. Yeah, if you want to raise deer numbers. Yeah, like in the UP. You, we've, we've talked about this, so we well, don't need to go Gre into. Greg's and Hayward. Yeah, there you go. So, you know, so summer food isn't always bad. If, Jen's father, Greg. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you need to, you know, build the deer herd and es establish deer numbers, that's not bad. No. But if you already have the numbers, then, yeah, then uh, it's bad. Then it's bad. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, you're not going to change the nutrition, health. A lot of people, and that's what food plot companies see do. Plant this and you'll grow big antlers. Mm -hmm. Throw this mineral out and you'll grow great antlers. And, you know, most of those companies, unless they're, I'll say ignorant. Well, what's what's a better word? Whatever. Um, yeah. Then um, they they know that that food. If they're smart, they know that that food doesn't grow big antlers. They know that mineral doesn't grow big antlers. If they're smart, and so that's part of the part of the marketing. And yeah. uh, we're not going to do that. Uh, we're not. But you want that experience to translate into results, and then base. And this goes online for anything hunting wise. Um, like we talk about, hunting has no measurables. 
just yeah. this is what you should do and that doesn't mean anything always put it in perspective um you're in a you know 80 acre chunk of wood surrounded by ag easiest to manage you're going to stay there for most of the year because they don't have any other place to go so what someone will preach out of an area like that doesn't translate to 95 percent of the rest of the country unless you're in that big big ag area mm -hmm. big woods area doesn't translate sure. so that kind of leads us into one other topic um, that is really critical it's and this is a different spin because it doesn't have to do with experience doesn't have to do with strategy it has to do with taking your money and your hard-earned dollars out of your wallet and throwing it out the window and that's called inert matter inert matter does matter greatly and what it means is I want you to look at the labels. We're trying to teach people to read the seed labels. When you go to the store mm -hmm. and you buy your seed, look at the label, look at the percentage of inert matter. We've seen some as high as over 50% inert matter. We've seen switchgrass that only has 40% germination rates, meaning you buy 10 pounds and the germina germination rate is 40%. It means you only get four pounds of viable seed that'll grow when you put it in the soil. Mm -hmm. So inert matter, same thing. 30% inert matter on 10 pounds, you That's get 7 good. pounds of seed. Yeah, not good. There's a lot that average 26, 28, 25, 12, whatever. Well, yeah, there are. And, <coughs> you know, and then uh, you see people online are just like, why are you selling your seed that for so much more money? It's just like, well, you're you're getting actually an extra half acre if you buy our seed, if you look at the label. Yeah. You know, so it's 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 just incredible. Uh, and, and I wasn't educated on that, how important it was to look at Hardly labels prior, um, you know, well, to... Well, who's going to teach you, the seed industry? No, of course they're not. <laughs> they're. Right, so just read your labels, look at your labels. It's so important to do so because you may find a bag that says, hey, this plant's a quarter of an acre, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's that's all I want to plant for my clover. And then you look at, and then you start reading the label, and you're like, this is going to plant half of what I need. And inner you know? matter is dust, debris, garbage. And you know what they... <clears throat> Excuse me. You know what they bank on is the is the hunting mentality that more is better. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I used to weigh out my seed exactly because I couldn't afford to do otherwise. I, if it was 0.72 acres, that's how much seed I put down. <laughs> is 0.72 acres worth? I measure it out ahead of time. I go very lightly over and then come back. So many people ask, you know, how what do I what setting? You can figure this stuff out in your own. Just go over light, go over light again. And the next time, next field you go to, raise that setting up a little bit. That's how we did it. I didn't have anyone saying what set. I'm not saying you don't ask for what setting to put it on. Mm. What I'm saying is it's easy to figure it out on your own with a little bit of work. But now we're in a, in today's time, in today's mentality. It's how do we do it? How do we do it? Instead of just figuring it out on your own. I always wanted to figure it out. I'm a figured out on your own type person. Yeah. I don't want to rely on someone else's advice because a lot of times that advice, you really have to consider the source. So if I did rely on someone else's advice, like Joel, the timber guy that we have come out here, he's a true expert. When I was shooting professional archery, I went to the best professional archers that I saw consistency in. And then I, and I looked at a bunch of them and common, common uh, shooting tips mm -hmm. between all of them. And that's how you learn. You go to the straight to the experts, but this inner matter stuff is, is, ridiculous mm -hmm. and and what they're doing in the whole seed industry is they're coating more and more and more seed with lime so it takes up space in the bag to improve profit margins mm -hmm. meaning 30 percent coating 20 percent coating sure there's coatings out there that might assist in germination to a very small percentage very small percentage so if you have 30 percent of coating in the bag it's not going to make up out of a 10 pound bag for the loss of three pounds for seed it's not. Mm -hmm. So there are coatings that could be good in so, some way, but most of it's uh, lime, which you need tons per acre, not pounds. And they're doing it purely to fill space. We know that for a fact. And <clears throat> sometimes they're even coloring it so it looks better mm -hmm. because you look at, oh, well, fancy that's a colors. Pretty color. Oh, boy, fancy colors. Look at it must be good. Look at our deer fence. <clears throat> Excuse me. You know, our deer fence blend that we have? First time I saw it, <laughs> that was my first thought. I'm like, oh, look how pretty that is. It doesn't have any coatings or anything on yeah. it. Um, it's completely pure. But um, yeah, yeah, it's, so I, I can, it's, I it's as like a attractive. female, yes, can totally appreciate that. Wow, oh, that's pretty. Colors. Yeah. Don't fall for the fancy colors. Inert matter, read the bag. If it's inert matter, it's 95% bad. Right. And, and it's not going to, and any good is not, most of it's dust, debris, garbage weed seed, lime coating, so be very wary. 
Summer draw, you know, we talk about that. That's not the lowest hole in the bucket. A lot of times people are planting summer food. It's creating that dough factory. Doughs that are here today are here to stay. It's a very true thing. It's one of the easiest fixes when you go to client parcels. Easy. Look at it. You have too many doughs. You don't have a lot of bucks in the fall. Reverse it. You always have to have does on the property to have bucks. And it's not because the bucks are attracted to the does. This is a big, big misunderstanding in the hunting community. More does don't equal more bucks. In fact, if there's so many does on the land that bucks live elsewhere, why are they going to come there during the rut? They've already established residency three quarters of a mile, mile away. Mm -hmm. Why are they going to come over to your property during the fall? They already have a home. Yep. They might come over for a half day. But if you're counting on a half day or two days or three days to make or break your three-month, four-month season, boy, that's a bad plan. Bad plan. That's a really bad plan. And so when you have a lot of does and fawns in your property during the summer, they're here to stay. They don't leave. They're home bodies. They have just a fraction of the home range of mature bucks. Mm -hmm. Then they're gone. Those bucks are gone. And they're not coming back. They establish home. And then all of a sudden you see a trend when you have summer food over and over and over again. Those bucks don't even come back during the rut. They don't even come back at night because they live somewhere else. Somewhere else. Not to mention all those does and food fawns have, consume your habitat, your well, that shrubs, and, bushes, well, trees. Well, then that I goes mean, back to, you know, stress, you know, herd stress. There's so many of them. And, yeah, your doe factory. So Yeah. One of the things... Um, you know, so be very wary of summer food. You need to raise your numbers, plant it. If you don't, don't plant it. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. We use summer food out here, clover. Yeah. In our hunting plots. And they're small. They're not large. About an acre and three quarter, I would guess, out of uh, 17 and a half acres of food. Yeah. And they're spread out. And if you look at that, if you, com com if you include our uh, uh, Wisconsin food plots, huh. we have uh, out of over about 20 and a half acres to 20 and three quarter acres of food, we have an acre and three quarter of clover, and that's just on mm. our hunting plots. Yeah, that's it. We don't actually sit on our plots in Wisconsin with a bow. We use them to build the property, which is critical, and then we kill those deer on their way to the food or the way from the food afternoon or morning, mm -hmm. depending on where we're sitting. Right. So because we'd spook all the deer off those plots, we'd ruin our land. Plain and simple. Right. got to look at this stuff black and white. Yeah. If, if, you, uh, can't get, if you can't get to the food plot... Uh, without spooking deer, don't ever put a stand there. No. Now, when you get to, uh, yeah, it's black and white. Mm -hmm. And uh, we see that. You know, that's yep. part of our hunt management. Mm -hmm. Sure is. With uh, brassica, we love brassica. Not everywhere do deer eat brassica. I'd say about 15% of all lands, 10% of all lands, they don't like it. Um, there's some lands that they hit it too hard. And that brings us into our big woods brassica. We put kale in our big woods brassica. It's a very large, aggressive, fast-growing, stemmed and leafed brassica variety. It is appropriate for areas of big woods where you have zero other food offerings and no food competition, so they're going to hit your food mm -hmm. a lot. No ag. No ag. But it's not just no ag. It's you want this in areas of high deer density, too high, really high deer density, or big woods where you have no competition, so they hit the food. Anywhere they aggressively hit your food, that's why we have big woods brassica. That's why we include the kale only in our big woods brassica. Time and time again, I go to clients in the spring. I was more to, to more this year, last year. There's a trend to put this kale into food plot blends, and then in a moderate deer area, balanced, frankly, in an area where people are actually doing a good job with their deer, balance and herd probably that have better hunting mm -hmm. um, and better herds, then that kale just sit and rots in the spring. We had it in our terrible blend three years ago that wasn't ours, and we said, don't put this garbage in there, but we literally had to clear shooting lanes by driving the side-by-side -side through it it's not good. on the hermit plot to actually hunt because if those things are uh, more than a finger size in diameter, if a bullet, sabot hits that, they're not going Done. to hit hit their intended target but they're there because you don't eat it and so we put that in an area where they aggressively hit the food plots and we do not put it in our our average brassica blend and that goes back to experience most people don't know the difference they just look at it wow this is green the client in ohio last year wow this is green and then they didn't hit it it was a big wasted two acre area which was his biggest food plot and one of his only food plots on the property and it severely hurt his property because of that terrible blend right. that was not appropriate for his area. That mm -hmm. goes us to mailbag. Do we have anything? Not today. 
Okay. We, we when I'm getting comments. It's funny. I get tons of comments on YouTube. Uh, for one, tell Jen happy birthday because oh, it was yeah, her birthday on the Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate all those. It's Jackson's birthday today, like we mentioned, and it could be Lily's birthday today or tomorrow. We'll so see. So we get a lot of <laughs> questions and comments and good lucks to yeah, you. Yeah, so thank you all so much. We yeah, really appreciate really it. Really nice. And you could tell you're wore out even just right now. And then Jen, got jo Jen has jokes. Jen's got jokes. However we say that, um, we had one yesterday in the car. I just don't think it's appropriate for a general audience. I was going to ask you if I could use that one. I think it's hilarious. I think it's hilarious too. But we try to keep this somewhat PG. like family friendly oriented. So we have this like neat bad dad jokes, you know, that we refer to every once in a while. So I'm just going to flip to a page and see what we got going on. Oh, this one might be a good one. What happened when the two antennas got married? I don't know. Well, ceremony was kind of boring, but the reception was great. Yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I would say that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that's, not a good as, one. Probably, that's a good one. It is that's a good, good one, but not as good as the one that we were talking about in the car okay. the other day. Seed blends. Experience matters. Results matter. Check out that inner matter. Avoid those bad brassica blends. You know, we can mention rye rye grass a perennial rye grass you know that makes a nice carpet of green sure. you don't like it just like your yard that's why we plant it in our green max traffic blend we mm -hmm. don't want deer actually consuming this at a hard very low rate. forage yeah low forage very low f attraction value yes. so read your seed labels but we're going to continue to do our best with the seed um innovate uh, mix different blends every year mm -hmm. and always trying to chase perfection and by doing that uh, we will always have a mission to improve and bring it to you and and i'll tell you the coating seeds just i'll add um there's more and more coated seeds every single year mm -hmm. they're doing it to improve profit margin and it's becoming harder to find uncoated seed and we had to pay extra this year to have the coating which was lime for a fact washed off so we didn't deliver crappy filler coated seed to you so a little little uh fact and tidbit um we'll even go to great lengths to pay extra mm -hmm. i don't even remember how much it was a pound it was a 60 cents a pound uh, it was it was higher than what i thought but I, we could use 60 cents a pound i think that would be fair yeah to, to just wash the seed mm -hmm. to get the garbage off it so when we say there's 10 pounds we're doing our darndest to make sure there is and that's signing off, and we're going to go have a baby. We sure are. Bye-bye.